In our second lesson on glucose metabolism from Chapter 13, we'll be looking at Phase 1, the first five steps of glycolysis. Here's an overview of those five steps. Remember our final product in the pathway will be pyruvate and that's illustrated at the top of the screen here. Our goal in the first five steps is to take a molecule of glucose, remember that's a six carbon compound, add a phosphoryl group to either end of the molecule and split it in two. In step one we add our first phosphoryl group we're going to change the form in step two before we add that second phosphate in step three. Step four splits the molecule in two and we have one more step to convert both products to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we start phase one with one molecule of glucose and we end with two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Step one is catalyzed by the enzyme hexokinase. We saw this enzyme briefly in an earlier chapter as an example of the induced fit model of binding substrate. We also looked at the overall reaction as an example of a coupled reaction. So the phosphorylation of glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate is unfavorable, but we couple that with the favorable hydrolysis of ATP. And so that the overall reaction is highly favorable. That is, the standard delta G is negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole. Remember, this is one of our three possible flux control points because of that large favorable change in delta G. That makes this an irreversible reaction, and that's indicated by the one-way arrow at the top of the screen here. Of course, we need that phosphoryl group eventually in any case, and by doing that for step one, it commits the molecule to the rest of the pathway, and it se sequesters glucose inside the cell. In other words, we have glucose transporters. If glucose concentration builds inside the cell, it will flow down its concentration gradient and out of the cell before we have a chance to use it. So by converting that to glucose 6-phosphate, we keep it inside the cell because we don't have glucose 6-phosphate transporters. And now we're ready for the next step in the pathway. That step is the isomerization of glucose 6-phosphate to form fructose 6-phosphate. All we've done is change the anomeric carbon in this step. The portion of the molecule that's changing is highlighted in red. So here we have glucose, the anomeric carbon is carbon number one. We convert that to fructose and therefore our anomeric carbon is now carbon number two. The standard delta G is slightly unfavorable, but it's made slightly favorable inside the cell due to reactant concentrations. It also is a near equilibrium reaction, freely reversible, and that's indicated by the two-way arrow. We'll see when we get to step four, we need a carbonyl at position number two in order to break the bonds between three and four. In step three, we're going to add our second phosphoryl group, and that's going to come from ATP again, so we convert fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphofructokinase. We looked at this enzyme in an earlier chapter as an example of allosteric regulation, and we'll look at the regulation of this enzyme more particularly in a later video. Note that in steps one and step three, it cost us a molecule of ATP each. That's the energy investment portion of this phase of the pathway, and we'll see in steps six through ten how we recoup that investment. So this is a large favorable change in delta G and therefore an irreversible step indicated by the one-way arrow. This is the actual flux control point or rate determining reaction in the pathway. And we'll see why in a later video. We've added the second phosphate that we need so that both our products will have a phosphoryl group. And by adding the phosphates on either end of the molecule, it destabilizes the molecule overall and makes it more likely that we'll be able to split it into two. Now we had to convert this to a ketose before we added our second phosphate. In other words, we need the carbonyl at position number two, but why couldn't we add the phosphate first and then form the carbonyl at position number two? If we had done that, we would have started with glucose 6-phosphate 
added the phosphoryl to position number one, but that would have been the anomeric carbon, and it would have been impossible after that to open the ring or do any more chemistry. So we had to do the isomerization, create the anomeric carbon at position number two, before we phosphorylated carbon number one. Hopefully you can see the logic and the steps, and I'm hoping that will make it easier for you to remember the steps and to get a nice overview of the pathway. Step four, we're going to cleave the molecule. It's a little bit easier to see in the Fischer projection. On the left, we have the Hayworth projection of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And of course, because we have that anomeric carbon at position number two, bound to an oxygen and an OH in the cyclic form, it can open up into the linear form, and that allows us to split the molecule between three and four. We'll have two molecules, and they're highlighted in red and black. We will form glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, an aldehyde, and an alcohol in the form of dihydroxyacetone phosphate when we split the molecule in two. This is essentially the reverse of an aldol condensation, and that's where the name of the enzyme comes from, aldolase. It has a large unfavorable change of in free energy under standard state conditions, but in the cell it's slightly favorable, and that's because we rapidly consume the products. In other words, the mass action ratio, the law of mass action, pulls it forward. It's still a near equilibrium reaction, so freely reversible, and we see those double arrows. So we have destabilized the molecule overall by adding the phosphoryl groups, making it easier to split the molecule. And we find that in order to split the molecule between carbons 3 and 4, we need an adjacent carbonyl group at position number 2, and that's why we did that isomerization in step 2. The final step in phase 1 is to convert dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is another isomerization reaction slightly unfavorable actual delta G, but we're going to rapidly consume glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and that pulls it forward. It makes sense to take the time to convert both molecules to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate so that they are identical for the rest of the pathway. It simplifies the, react the regulation of the pathway overall. If we didn't do that, we'd have to have five steps to, control to convert glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to pyruvate and a separate five steps and a separate five enzymes to convert dihydroxyacetone phosphate into pyruvate. So it makes sense to take one more step to make sure that both molecules are identical for the rest of the pathway. The enzyme that catalyzes that isomerization, triose phosphate isomerase, is a good example of a catalytically perfect enzyme. Remember, it operates at the diffusion controlled limit so that as soon as it finds substrate, it binds it and forms product. You can see the ribbon diagram here. On the left, it's unbound. On the right, we see the transition state analog in orange, and you can see the loop closure in green over that molecule. So there's definitely a conformational change that occurs in this enzyme. In our next video lesson, we'll see how in steps 6 through 10, we're going to recoup our original investment and gain a little bit more besides. And we'll look at that net product of glycolysis.